Hi, welcome to the video solution for past paper. This is Edexcel IEL Physics, January 2020, the second video of the series. So let's start. Question number 16. Some spiders may be seen suddenly moving up into the air even when there is no wind. This happens when they let out strands of web. The spiders are pulled upward as the electrically charged strands of web interact with the Earth's electric field. The average strength of Earth's electric field is 120 volt per meter downwards. State with reason the polarity of the charge on the strands of the web. So what is happening if this is the surface of the Earth and this is, you know, a kind of a strand? A string so they said that uh, the spiders are pulled up upward uh, because of the electrically charged strand so this strand is going up meaning and the reason is the earth has electric field 120 volt per meter downward and this downward word is showing that the earth has negative electric field in fact, it is true that uh, our Earth is a negative charge uh, carrier. So uh, that means this negative charge Earth repel the charge strand. And due to repulsion, we can say that this strand should have a negative charge. That's how you need to explain. Part B, a spider moves upward after letting out a strand of web. Determine the initial upward acceleration of a spider. Mass of a spider is this and total magnitude of charge on the strand of web is this much. So you see what is happening. Uh, the spider is going upward due to electrical repulsive force. Uh, you can say this is electrical force Fe and also we know that the spider has mass so there must be a weight acting downward but the spider is accelerating upward that means we have net force F so we can say that uh, for a spider the net force F which is uh, Ma is equal to uh, Fe electrical force minus W that means Fe is electrical force and electrical force can be found as uh, EQ if you see the definition of uh, uh, electric field strength electric field strength is force per unit charge force per unit charge so F is equal to EQ so Fe I just use a, a small e just you know to mention that this is electrical force otherwise if you wish you cannot uh, you don't need to use Fe just to distinguish so uh, Fe electrical force EQ minus mg clearly we have everything we can figure out acceleration so acceleration is equal to EQ minus mg divided by m you substitute all the numbers and you say acceleration is equal to E. E is the electrical field strength on the surface of the earth which is 120 times charge on the web strand and charge on the web strand is uh, 3 into 10 to the power minus 7 minus mass of the spider 3 into 10 to the power minus 6 G 9.81 divided by mass of the spider which is 3 into 10 to the power minus 6 you solve this you have answered 2.19 or you say acceleration is 2.2 meter s minus 2 this is the acceleration 2.2 C. The Earth has an electric field because uh, 
charge is distributed over its surface determine the quantity of charge on 1 meter square on of the surface of the earth which would cause an electric field of 120 volt per meter you should assume that the charge is distributed evenly radius of the earth is 6400 kilometer so what do we need to find uh, we need to find quantity of charge on 1 meter square so we need to find charge on 1 meter that means we need to find Q by A charge per unit area so if you recall a formula relating electric field strength and amount of charge which is E is equal to K Q by R square so this case Coulomb constant so you can say E is equal to K is 1 upon 4 pi epsilon naught permittivity of free space into Q by R square. And why am I doing all these things? Because we know that Earth is, uh, you know, assumed to be spherical in shape. So what I'm doing here, I'm just rearranging this equation. So 4 pi along with this r square. So I can write 1 upon epsilon naught into q by 4 pi r square. And 4 pi r square, just, this is just for your information, 4 pi r square is surface area of a sphere. Surface area of this sphere. So that means this is q by a. So charge per unit area, that's what we need to find. So Q by 4 pi R square would be equal to E times epsilon naught because on the left hand side you have E. So you just multiply uh, permittivity of free space with the electric field strength. So we have a charge per unit area and uh, uh, electric field is 120 times permittivity of free space so you can use your uh, value given in your data sheet permittivity of free space you can find over there so epsilon naught the value of epsilon naught is 8.85 10 to the power minus 12 this number is given and unit will be uh, you know uh, uh, it says uh, you see here so k k is uh, uh, what is the unit of so we can use this uh, epsilon naught here 8.85 10 to the power minus 12 so we have charge per unit area so you can say charge per unit area is equal to uh, you just multiply 120 by 8.85 so you have answer 1062 into 10 to the power minus eight. this is sorry this is minus 12 so minus 12 and when you shift the decimal here so 1.06 that means 1.1 into 10 to the power 3 decimal minus 9 uh, coulomb meter minus 2 this is charge per unit area question number 17 a student is designing a night light for a child when switched on the night light should come on brightly uh, and its intensity should then gradually decrease to zero the time taken for the light intensity to decrease to zero should be as close to 10 minutes. The diagram shows the student's design, a capacitor, LED, resistor, 12 volt power supply. The student uses a light emitting diode and a resistor R. The LED stops emitting light when the potential difference across it falls to 1.4. The student assume that assume the LED has a constant resistance of 340 ohm. A capacitor with the following capaci capacitances are available 0 0.5, 0 0.51, 0 0.54 and so on. Determine which capacitance 
the student should use so we need to find the value of C for this condition uh, resistance R is 860 so idea is if you recall charging and discharging of the capacitor first the capacitor is fully charged under 12 volt and then when you uh, switch on the LED or you you know shift the the two way switch here so capacitor starts discharging through resistor R and the LED and the LED starts lightening up so we need to first find how many voltage there will be across um, LED and that would be the initial voltage when just capacitor starts uh, you know discharging at t equal to zero so we need to find the initial volt v naught and uh, we know that the final voltage after time t uh, time t this is t is given we have the final voltage this is v so the idea is because we need to find c so we are going to use equation v is equal to v naught e to the power minus t upon rc because we have everything we have resistance 860 we have time 10 minutes v naught will be the initial voltage that we need to figure out when the capacitor just starts discharging and v is the final voltage 1.4 so we can figure out value of c and how do we find the voltage now if you see v led and r they are in series with the power supply so we can use uh, potential divider your as topic if you if you recall potential divider uh, and we can use the equation of potential divider like if you need to find uh, voltage across any resistor in potential divider v1 should be equal to r1 divided by r1 plus r2 into voltage of the source this is the voltage across the resistor r1 now i'm considering voltage across led so we know that v naught would be equal to uh, voltage uh, the led has a resistor 340 so 340 divided by r1 plus r2 340 plus uh, 860 times 12 and if you solve this so v naught would be equal to 3.4 volt this is the v naught or initial voltage now we can use uh, v is equal to v naught so i'm using this equation i'm not writing again so v is equal to v naught v is the final and v naught is the initial so final voltage is 1.4 so 1.4 is equal to 3.4 e to the power minus t by r c t is 10 minutes which is uh, 10 time 60 600 divided by uh, r r is the total uh, total resistance because we have a total resistance here so total resistance will be uh, remember don't confuse this r this r here this r is not just r 860 because the capacitor is charging through the total resistance so this r is different than this r this r is in fact rt total resistance which is uh, 340 plus 860 and 340 plus 860 is uh, 1200 so this r in this formula this r should be 1200 times c and now so you can send 3.4 on the other side so 1.4 divided by 3.4 it will be 0 0.4 double one seven e to the power minus uh, 600 divided by 1200 0 0.5 upon c and now because we need to find c this which is in power of e so we need to take nt log or, or you you know you, you apply log on both sides ln you apply ln both sides those who are studying mathematics they know very well when you apply ln so this e is gone and you need to take uh, use your calculator to find log of this when you find log of 0 0.4117 so answer will be uh, like i'm saying that you need to apply here ln and ln both sides this ln and this e is gone and log of uh, 0 0.417 it will give you minus 0 0.887 
is equal to this log cancel this e and this minus 1.5 by c will come here so minus 0 0.5 divided by c now you can rearrange and minus minus gone so c would be equal to 0 0.55 divided by 0 0.887 it will be 0 0.56 farad this is the capacitor that we found the value but available capacitor is 0 0.5 0 0.51 0 0.54 so we should use 0 0.58 since t should be equal to or greater than 10 minutes because they are saying that the time taken for the the time must not be less than 10 so we should use higher capacitance not the less capacitance so t should be so c must be equal to at least 0 0.5 5, 8. Uh, don't forget unit farad. In practice, the resistance of the LED does not stay constant. The graph shows how current varies with potential difference for LED. So this is a typical uh, diode graph or LED graph for current potential difference and V 1.4 volt is 3 shoulder volt so explain uh, how the behavior of the LED shown in the graph will affect the time taken for the light intensity to decrease to zero now if you see what is happening this is IV graph remember first of all I V and for IV graph gradient is 1 upon resistance or resistance is 1 upon gradient one of the key point here now what is happening if you go along the curve if you go back something like this so as voltage is decreasing voltage is decreasing gradient of the curve is also decreasing if you if you if you go back to the you know to towards the zero volt so if voltage is decreasing you say gradient is also decreasing now if gradient decrease what about the resistance so resistance should be increased that means uh, the capacitor will uh, discharge in 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 more time it will take more time to discharge so led will be you know giving light for more time it will not uh, going to zero uh, soon it will take more time uh, to become zero intensity or to, to become faint something like whatever you say so these are the three key ideas uh, and the linking with the time voltage is decreasing gradient decreasing so resistance increase so of course uh, led will take more time uh, for in, in intensity to decrease to zero so that's how you can write The student states the capacitor is being used in the circuit. The function of the capacitor is to store electric charge. Explain why this is not a complete description of the function of a capacitor. This is a general, uh, you know, concept of a capacitor. Generally, we say that the capacitor is a device that that you know, uh, used to store the charge. But there is more function of the capacitor. First of all, if you see what is happening in a capacitor, in capacitor we have uh, two plates, plate A and plate B. And then on both of the plate we are storing charge, that's per the definition, the main definition. So in one plate we have a negative charge, in the other plate we have a positive charge. So this is one important point, the capacitor stores the charge, but it stores the charge in a way that it is separating charge with each other but if I ask you what is the overall uh, nature of the capacitor what is the overall charge on the capacitor so overall charge is zero that means even it is a storing charge capacitor stays neutral and uh, moreover uh, you know it's uh, other than storing charge its ability is it's also store energy in it and uh, you can also you know uh, say that capacitor is is used to maintain uh, constant voltage in a circuit so there are other function that we can you know describe and the behavior of the function of a capacitor so that's how you can write all these points
Question number 18, the photograph shows a demonstration AC generator used in a school. This is AC generator, south pole, north pole, coil, handle. Okay, the handle is used to rotate the coil between the magnetic poles. Uh, when a light emitting diode LED is connected across the coil, the LED flashes on and off as the coil rotates. Explain this observation. Clearly, a typical question of electromagnetic induction, we have, we have a rotation of a coil in a magnetic field. So we say that when the coil is rotated or rotates in the magnetic field, that causes, you know, the coil in a magnetic field. So we have a flux link with the coil. So you can say we have a flux linked with the coil and as it is rotating so we have a change in flux so after change in flux of course we have emf produced or emf induced in the coil emf in the coil and then uh, and when you connect because we are using led so we are completing a circuit diagram and the current produced or emf produced causes led to flash but because this is AC generator, for AC generator we have uh, one positive cycle, the other one is negative cycle. For one of the cycle, uh, the diode is in uh, forward bias and the other cycle it will be in negative, uh, sorry, in, in reverse bias. It depends on the polarity of the LED. But for one cycle it must be in forward bias, so allow current to pass, so, so it will flash. And the other cycle will be, should be or must be in reverse bias, so current will not pass, so it will not flash. So that's how you can combine all these points. Part B, the output potential difference V for the generator is recorded using a data logger and a graph is produced of V against time. So this is the graph of produced EMF using the generator voltage or EMF induced and the time taken. Add to graph to show the output if the angular velocity of the generator coil is halved. So if velocity or angular velocity is halved, so it will be moving slowly. So the rate of change of flux is will be less. So you know, if it is halved, so it will take longer time, more time to generate EMF and half means the time will be double and EMF will be half. So you can say that if this is a 4.8, so it will be 2.4. Half of EMF will be 2. Point, so 4.4, 4, 4.8. So EMF 4.8. So 2.4. That means you say something like this is the peak EMF will be there, and then here. something like this. So time double and EMF will be half because of the half uh, of the EMF, uh, sorry, angular velocity. Or you can just complete the cycle. So what I was saying, add graph to show output of the angular velocity. Yeah, you can just keep going on something like, you know, here and then Yeah, and then something like this. Explain the change in the graph when the angular velocity of the coil is halved. As I explained, the big angular velocity is halved. So you say that the EMF is proportional to rate of change of flux. So if a rate of change of flux is half, EMF will be half, and velocity is half. So of course it will take uh, more time or uh, double time to complete, you know, the the EMF or generate the EMF.
the coil rotates in a uniform magnetic field at the original angular velocity the average magnitude of V is 3.2 volt determine the number of turns in the coil magnetic flux density is this and cross-sectional area of the coil is this so we need to find number of uh, turn that means we need to find n and the idea is we are going to use uh, Faraday's law of, laws of induction since E is equal to n d phi by dt and also we are going to combine this formula with the because we don't have flux but we know that d phi is b a because we are given magnetic field and the area so we can combine this we can write this equation as emf induced is n b a divided by dt and dt is the change in time or time required for the change of flux for the change of flux for a given emf and uh, n uh, sorry b e is given which is 3.2 b n a also given we can find n but we need to figure out this delta t or dt dt remember is the time to change the flux uh, for this 3.2 volt so we need to find dt from the graph so let's just go back and see how can we do that so if you go back to the previous slide and if you see 3.2 volt so for for that uh, cycle the the emf is generated which is uh, the easiest way there are many ways that we can find dt one method that i can think of is you just figure out 3.2 here 3.2 must be this point and the other 3.2 will be this point so this is the change in time change in flux when we have uh, produced emf and this time if you count the number of box and uh, the total interval uh, the one box so this time or this dt would be equal to 0 0.05 second that's how you can figure out time and there are some other method so dt is 0 0.05 so let's just go back and uh, so let's do the calculation I gave you E is equal to B A N divided by D T. So E is uh, 3.2 is equal to B is uh, 0 0.083 times area is 0 0.0048 divided by N is also there. Number of turns that we need to find divided by D T which is 0 0.05. And then when you solve this for n, so n would be equal to 401.6. So you round it off, n is equal to 402 turns. Question number 19, the first cyclotron was created by E.O. Lawrence in 1931. Lawrence obtained an expression for the time t for a particle of charge Q and mass m to complete a circle path in a uniform magnetic field of magnetic flux density B. The expression obtained by Lawrence is this, t is equal to 2 pi m by BQ. Drive this expression. Remember, this t is the time for a complete one circular path okay we need to drive this you know that in a in a in a you know cyclotron we have two d's and in which a particle is you know complete completing circular path something like this so we have a, you know a magnetic force acting 
on this charged particle and then magnetic force is acting as a centripetal force so you can say that the magnetic force f is uh, is equal to uh, b q v and this uh, 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 magnetic force is also uh, behaving as a centripetal force so m v square over r and now one v gets cancelled so you have equation b q over m v over r and if you see in our required equation we need to involve in uh, somehow t here and then b q is fine because we need b q but we, but but we don't need v and r so we need to get rid of this v from this equation and how do we do that for a circular motion we know that v velocity will be equal to 2 pi r for a complete circle 2 pi r divided by t t is the time for one revolution i'm using t because they are using t so now we can rearrange this equation for v by r is equal to 2 pi by t and now this v by r can be replaced here in this equation so bq is equal to m into v by r and v by r is 2 pi by t just rearrange this equation so you have t is equal to 2 pi m by bq this is your required equation In Lorentz cyclotron, an alternating potential difference was used to accelerate particle to high energies. Explain the significance of the expression obtained by Lorentz to operation of a cyclotron. Now we need to explain significance of expression. So expression was t is equal to 2 pi m by bq. Now if you see the operation of a cyclotron, Again, we have two Ds, something like this. And then a charged particle is uh, circulating in a circular path, maybe at this path, or maybe a small path. It doesn't matter. So you see, no matter at what path uh, the uh, charged particle is circling, for one complete cycle, whether there is a path one in this diagram or path two. If I ask you to find the time for the path one and the path two, so you will use the same expression. That means even you see the difference. We have a different radius. And of course, uh, it, uh, the charged particle moves at a di uh, different speed. So that means no matter what track we choose, path one and path two, the time uh, for one revolution is independent of the speed and the radius so it will take same amount of time in each d's so what does this mean if the particle is coming from the shorter path here or maybe a longer path it will take same amount of time to reach the other end and the purpose of this is because at the precise time we will have to flip the polarity so that the electron or the charge can accelerate so electron accelerate between these d's so as soon as the the charge uh, about to exit from 1d we flip the polarity so that the elect the the charge uh, can goes into another d and uh, this time interval between flipping the frequency always remains same because the time reach to the other end is always remains same that's why uh, we we need a constant frequency or constant rate we keep changing the polarity between the d's because time independent of v and r In 
cyclotron in a cyclotron in which Lorentz expression applies, proton were accelerated to a speed of 1.5 10 to the power 7 meter per second. Determine the time taken to accelerate the proton to this speed from rest. Magnetic flux density is 1.6. Accelerating potential difference is 13 kilo volt. Okay, so we have voltage B and we have maximum speed and it is accelerating from speed 0 to rest. Okay, so first of all, we are going to find time taken by the proton for one cycle. So we know that T is equal to 2 pi m by uh, BQ and you substitute all the values 2 into pi which is 3.14 into m is the mass of the proton 1.6 given in your data sheet 1.67 into 10 to the power minus 27 divided by b is 1.6 charge of the proton is as same as charge of electron given in your data sheet so 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 and when you solve this so t would be equal to 4.1 into 10 to the power minus 8 second. Remember, this is the time for proton or uh, taken by the proton for one cycle. In each cycle, it is taking that much time and it, it will be constant for each cycle. Okay, because time is independent of speed and, and radius. Okay, and now because uh, uh, we are giving uh, we are given you know a speed so we can maximum speed so we can find the maximum energy gained by the proton so maximum energy max energy so max energy ek would be equal to of course half mv squared straight for straightforward calculation so half m is uh, mass of the proton 1.67 into 10 to the power minus 27 into v square and v square is 1.5 into 10 to the power 7 meter per second is square when you solve this you have energy ek is equal to 1.88 into 10 to or 1.9 if you wish 10 to the power minus 13 joule this is the maximum energy gained and now here is a key idea we are given accelerating potential difference this is the potential difference see what i'm doing here and then i will explain i am finding i am converting this uh, voltage into energy and i will i will explain later on explain uh, this energy and how do we do that we know that the definition of voltage v uh, is equal to energy per unit charge and in this case energy is equal to voltage times charge so voltage is 13000 times charge charge is uh, 1.6 big because of proton 10 to the power minus 19 when you solve this your energy would be equal to uh, when you solve it so 2.08 into 10 to the power minus 15 joule now you know that this is the energy that we uh, we, we get uh, we got from the voltage meaning this is the energy supplied for one cycle this is the energy for one cycle and how many how much energy the charge or the proton has uh, obtained this is the total energy that the charge has obtained so if you if you divide if you divide the total energy gained by the proton with the energy given for one cycle given for one cycle we can have 
uh, you know a number of uh, passes from the d's so what i'm going to do number of passes number of passes is equal to this energy 1.88 into 10 to the power minus 13 divided by 2.08 10 to the power uh, minus 15 and then you say you have answer uh, 90.4 number of passes that mean in in each cycle it is passing 90.4 times so since in one cycle in one cycle how many passes you we, we have a d here so when the proton completes one cycle so how many passes are there two one and then two so for one cycle we have two passes and how many passes do do we have here 90 so for 90.4 passes maybe we should use this so 94 90.4 passes then how many cycles are there so you can find x so x would be equal to 45.2 45.2 cycles now we have number of cycles so uh, time for one cycle is uh, 4.1 so total time t is 45.2 times uh, time for one cycle so 4.1 into 10 to the power minus 8 so total time t would be equal to 1.85 into 10 to the power minus uh, 6 second this is the time for that proton explain why high energy particles are required to investigate the structure of the nucleus or nucleon remember the structure of the nucleus the structure of the nucleon always required uh, high energy particle the reason is due to high energy uh, the particles has a high momentum so momentum is generally quite high and uh, because of high momentum according to de Broglie lambda the wavelength of the particle will be h upon m v or h upon p and you see that lambda is inversely proportional to p so momentum is higher so lambda will be smaller or small enough to investigate the structure of the uh, nucleus or structure of the nucleon because the lambda is approximately equal to size of the nucleon so we can study the nucleus or the nucleon whatever the question is sometimes they ask the nucleus as well so that's how you can incorporate all the points. Thank you very much. I hope you understand. See you in the next video. Have a nice time.